The one of the things I'm most excited to share with you today is this concept of intercultural schema, or a schema for short. And this is what I'm going to be talking about primarily, and it's uh, it as an evolution to the mosaic. Now, this is my first Lego set. I got this in the 70s. My dad brought it home one day, uh, right around the same time that multiculturalism came into being as a policy. And uh, it's missing parts. It's a bit worn down. You can see my teeth mark, marks where I've been <laughs> chewing on it. And I've tried to rebuild it as close as I can. I love this thing. I love LL918. Now, check this out. <laughs> I love it. This is the Lego my nephew bought me, my, eight, my uh, eight-year-old nephew bought me two years ago. Now, this is amazing. This is a, a manga-inspired uh, exosuit. Now, the interesting thing about multiculturalism is it's not just a policy, or it's not just an experience. There's something about multiculturalism that touches your imagination, that says, this is how we could live together. Now, the thing is, the thing about imaginations is that imaginations evolve. They don't stay static. So although I love the LL918, kids today look at that, and they're not excited about it because it's a relic, right? Now, in the same way, multiculturalism as a conceptual tool for talking about diversity in Canada today is also a relic. We need something that captures the imagination of us today. Last week, I was in Seoul, and I met the most interesting couple there. Uh, this couple's mixed race and transnational identity really blow open the doors of, of the mosaic. Like Canada, Korea is challenged with this new Korean identity. Their experience of Korean identity is not keeping up with the language and the concepts. Or sorry, the reverse. The concepts of Korean identity are not keeping up with the experience of what it means to be Korean. So Andreas, he's a second uh, generation mixed race uh, Austrian and uh, Korean uh, of Austria. And Korean descent, and uh, his beautiful uh, girlfriend next to him, Yulia, is a fourth generation Uzbek of Korean ancestry. So, of course, she spoke perfect Korean and perfect English with a charming Russian accent. <laughs> the mosaic fails to encompass the contemporary complexity of their multi ethnic and their trans cultural identities that really are ubiquitous to urban life, not just in Canada, but around the world. Now, they plan to move to Canada at some point, and so I wonder what tile in the mosaic would they actually occupy? Cultural navigators like uh, Montreal-born Cedric Sam have inspired me to look for or to develop on our own alternative, mo alternative models to the mosaic. Now, we often speak of the experiences of people like, uh, like Cedric as being a vague in-between cultures. I'm sure you've heard of this before. We use terms like hybridity, hyphenated, bicultural. And if you're an Asian-Canadian person, you've heard all of these. And sometimes you might even be referred to as a banana, which none of us like, by the way. It's, uh, it basically assumes that you're white on the inside, trapped in a you know, non white body really doesn't work to describe the blended reality. Now, I call people like Cedric cultural navigators because of their cultural fluidity. Cultural navigators are broadly defined as those able to maneuver through and around complex networks of cultural spaces. And these are networks that they've built through immigration, through their family roots, through social capital, and through living in diverse cities all over the world. In more conventional demographic terms, oh, I skipped a slide. In more demographic, uh, uh, in more conventional terms, uh, cultural navigators are primarily composed of 1.5 and second generation. Uh, they don't have to just be Canadians. Now, 1.5 gens are people who immigrated somewhere, uh, were immigrated as a young child, and so the age of when that was is, is up for debate. Like, not, like, like my friends in South Korea and, uh, of course, Cedric, their identity is so complex and so uh, interesting and challenging that we just don't really have the language to describe it. Now, Cedric blogs about what it means to be Chinese in Montreal. And uh, despite the fact that he was born and raised in Montreal and has spoken fluent French since the age of six, he is often asked if he was adopted. So I have this great story. When I was in London last year, and I had a chance to speak to uh, a number of uh, things, uh, uh, occasions. I got to meet some people from BBC. It was a real professional high for me. And on the way home, I jumped into this cab. I was totally late for my plane. I was totally going to miss it. But I was still on such a high. And, and the cab says, what, are you, what were you doing in, in, in London? And I was talking fast. It's the fastest I'm talking right now. And suddenly, <laughs> about five minutes, he just can't take it anymore. He turns to me, and he goes, but you're not really Canadian, though, are you? And I kind of thought, wow, no, the Canadian public sent an imposter. And how would you know? <laughs> Perhaps this is the same thing. This is the same thing that happens for Indian families that have lived in Britain for generations, but aren't really considered British. You know, Canadians like me have to deal with this scrutiny, especially when we travel overseas, because for the most part, in most places of the world, ancestry and ethnicity still define your identity. But I don't, don't just get asked this question in, in, uh, you know, overseas. I get asked this question all the time, also in Canada. And last week, I was asked in Vancouver. 
a couple weeks ago, and I answered with, well, Vancouver, and that's not really the answer they wanted. So they said, well, where are you really from? Where's your parents from? And I was kind of annoyed at that. So I said, well, we moved to Vancouver from Regina, right? <laughs> not really the answer they wanted either. Now, this is Erba Okren Cesar. She uh, lives in Toronto. Her family's been in Guelph, Ontario for four generations, and so she gets asked this question and those series of questions all the time, and her answer is Guelph, Guelph, and Guelph, and Guelph. So finally, after a lifetime of being asked this question, she finally just says, are you interested to know where the non-white part is? She's, you know, let's just get to the point. Why is this such a loaded question in Canada? Because not everyone gets this. Well, historically, because uh, historically in the United States and in Canada, immigrants were treated differently depending on where you were from. Some were interned, some were forced to pay head taxes, some were asked to settle the coldest parts of our prairies, while others were said, you know, move here, they have nice views. Cultural navigators like Cedric and Ereba struggle with the multiculturalism policy in Canada and the mosaic because this policy uses ethnicity as the main identifier. Essentially, you're oversimplified to being an ethnic tag. So in other words, in the mindset of the mosaic, you are your ethnicity regardless of how little or how much it is actually part of your everyday life. The ethnocultural mosaic, or what I'm calling multiculturalism 1.0, relies on clear and simple responses to that question, where are you from? Which really doesn't work for most Canadians or most people in the world with complex identities. Now there's a number of things that have uh, caused the trends that have pushed multiculturalism 2.0 into being. And often we talk about immigration and we talk about shifts in demographics. But I'd like to propose that technology has had the biggest impact on multiculturalism 2.0. There's a number of reasons why. The first reason is that technology is moving at a rate much, much faster than demographics and populations. Simply because technology has been driven by commerce and industry. Secondly, developed nations value the rate of technological advancement as a, uh, uh, um, a measure of success. And so policy around technology is meant to accelerate technology, not slow it down. Whereas immigration policy is always designed to control it, to mitigate it. Thirdly, the growth of the internet and the reduction of their manufacturing costs to processing power ratio have made computer technology accessible to everyone. And just as a, an example of how technological factors are having a huge social impact, this is a blogger, Phil Yu. He writes a blog in the US called Angry Asian Man. And here he's speaking to a group uh, at University of British Columbia uh, from his home in LA via Skype. You know, for the first time in the internet's history, something other than pornography is driving the web. And we know that, social, mar social networking. And uh, we know the blogosphere is, is rapidly growing constantly. These technological advancements have increased Canadians' mobility as well as their connectedness. So we're not only a more diverse population, we're also a more technologically savvy population, staying connected in real time with families and, lo and loved ones overseas. This is my brother-in-law, Ron. He's a uh, Thompson-born Chinese-Canadian, very successful electrical engineer in, in Hong Kong. And uh, normally, like millions of Chinese, every year he makes the journey home, which would be Vancouver, for Chinese New Year. This particular year, he decided he would spend Chinese New Year in Hong Kong, and so he joined us via broadband. And uh, he had pizza uh, while we had Chinese food. And, uh, you know, he's just, it, it seemed like he was there. And after the meal, his mom came up to him and started nagging about when he was going to get married. And his dad had stock tips for him. <laughs> It was like he was there, and you know, this technology has let, helped Canadians, whether they're living abroad or in Canada, connect with the news, the culture, and the interests of their countries of origin. In 2003, Ipsos Reid uh, this, did this really great study for the Center for Research and Information on Canada and the Globe and Mail. One of the things that they found was that 1.5 gens and second gens have an incredible sense of social, cultural, and uh, economic mobility. Now, they're important to multiculturalism 2.0 because these generations are a natural bridge between immigrant communities and what we would consider mainstream North America. They're affluent and they're well-connected and they're innovators. And you might recognize this 1.5 gen, Steve Chen, he's the co-founder of YouTube. The second thing was the study showed that Canadians uh, have, a huge, have made a huge shift in the attitudes towards ethnicity. When asked how important ethnic background was when choosing a spouse, what they'd said was it was the, 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 mo the least important thing. The most important thing, as you'll see, is attitudes towards family and morals. Now, this is really important because we take this for granted in the US and in Canada, but for many countries in Europe and in Asia, ancestry still determines your identity. And uh, this is important because often where xenophobia will organically manifest itself is within families at the advent of an interracial marriage. About five years ago, 
I gave a, a talk to a group at Simon Fraser University, a very mixed group, and um, I started the presentation by saying, how many here had been in or are in right now a uh, mixed race relationship? And to my surprise, every student raised their hand. So I thought, okay, I'll push this further. How many here are okay with having a mixed race child? And again, every student raised their hand. Now that day, I had an ESL student uh, from an East Asian country, and she was sitting next to me. And you can kind of see her in a pink shirt. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw her frozen in terror at this question. So after the presentation, I apologized. And I said, I'm really sorry. I had no idea this would make you uncomfortable. And then she confesses to me that she was mortified at the thought of, having, of not having a pure child. A few years later, I, gave this, I told this story in Kuala Lumpur to a group of broadcasters. And I asked them, which Asian Pacific country do you think she was from? And there was this weird silence as every representative of 20 countries thought it was their own. <laughs> Vancouver, on the other hand, has the highest percentage of mixed race marriage in North America. At first, you know, this doesn't make sense because many people consider Vancouver to be part of Asia. It's no longer the gateway to Asia, it is Asia. <laughs> so you might assume that Vancouver would reflect the xenophobic tendencies that you'd find in Asia, but actually it's quite the opposite. Overall, mixed race relationships are mainstream in Canada. I'm not saying they're any easier to manage, they're just more mainstream. This does not suggest, however, that cultural similarities are not important. What this means is that Canadians are comfortable with ethnic and racial difference so long as your attitude towards family and your morals are the same, especially for those ages 18 to 30. This is, um, neither does the research suggest that ethnicity is not important. According to this slide, ethnicity is very important. You'll see that for visible minorities and for, for immigrant populations, but just in general, for all the respondents of this, uh, for this survey. It is important, but not so important that it would be a barrier for companionship or for when choosing a, a partner. Now, I've just described some of the new features for Multiculturalism 2.0, and I love using this technological language. I want you to really think of diversity as a piece of software in your brain. Now, the biggest new feature is a new model, model for cultural diversity, what I'm calling the intercultural schema, or the schema for short. And there are three fundamental assumptions that differentiate the schema from the ethnocultural mosaic. These uh, assumptions also demonstrate the how the mosaic is functionally obsolete. The first assumption is that ethnicity informs your identity, but does not define it. But in contrast, the mosaic is essentialist. It basically takes up all of you and reduces you to what your ethnicity is, regardless of how little or how much it is a part of your life. That's, like I said, it's very problematic. Now, this is US, Barack, uh, US President Barack Obama playing with his niece. When he was asked about being black, he responded in saying, my being black has informed who I am, but no longer defines who I am. And in the same way, I'm not asking anyone in the audience to forget that I'm brown or Filipino or to pretend it's not important to me, as the myth of colorblindness might suggest. My being brown is very important to me, in fact, because I've been brown for a very long time. <laughs> Rather, like President Obama, my being an ethnic minority or person of color informs who I am, but no longer defines who I am. The second thing is, is that cultural identity is fluid, and we know this is true. The mosaic, on the other hand, assumes your cultural identity is static, that it's, it's, it's a rigid model. In reality, our, our identities, they, they evolve from moment to moment. So one moment, I'm a brown Canadian talking uh, to uh, uh, a whole new whiteness, the whole, uh, about the idea of a whole new whiteness in Korea, and the next day, I'm a karaoke superstar. <laughs> Same mic, different context, and we all know our identities adjust <laughs> to our situations and our influences. Third, our schemas include all forms of culture, and you know this, our identities are shaped by more than just our ancestry. We are a collective mashup of all sorts of things, like our heritage, our work culture, our education. The mosaic, in being based on ethnic allegiance, assumes that all this other stuff that make up who you are, like media, literature, and travel, do not matter. So how do we represent this complexity? You know, like, I'm one of those people that ha likes to draw things. I have to draw things to think. So I need, I need pictures to make sense of, of complex ideas. And here's my, some of my first uh, attempts to try to, to, to uh, you know, reflect identity as a complex thing, like a molecule or a cell. And where I actually found the answer was on the internet. Your schema is very similar to your web identity. So this is a drawing of my web identity. Now, when you occupy a website, your web identity is usually different from website to website. Now, imagine each of the websites you use on a daily basis as a web space you occupy. Now, if you were to draw all the web spaces you occupy, you could draw a schema or a map 
of your web identity. And what would it would represent is all the different identities you are online. And, and actually, it'd be a measure of how mobile and how, um, how you're able to navigate the uh, online space. Now, in the exact same way, we occupy and use complex networks of cultural spaces. Because of that, we have to rethink how we understand people. So rather than thinking of people as, uh, as, as ethnic or of an ancestry, we need to begin to see people as the product of their cultural fluidity. We can replace this question of where are you from with what are the cultural spaces that you move through? What is your schema? A variety of experiences such as travel, languages, education, marriage, and passions can, can make up your schema. So I'm going to go real, because I've run out of time. There are, three, uh, uh, there are three parts to your schema. There's your core. These are the things that are the most fixed, like your ancestry and the places you've lived in the world. Uh, my dad was a pastor, and so the church is a big part of my core. There's the middle section, which is a little more uh, fluid, but it's, it's not entirely fluid. And these are things that don't change very much at all. So my magazine, my work, and all the spaces that they connect me to. And the last area is the most fluid, and it's the outer layer. And uh, these are the things that are changing all the time. So through my speaking, I've had a chance to touch TEDx and Pachatska and Korea and, uh, and the not-for-profits I'm involved in and the, the things that I'm now uh, uh, starting to get passionate about. So this is uh, my first birthday. You know, and the family picture is often a picture or a symbol of harmony. And people might say that this is a, a, a diverse family picture. And I, I, I need to challenge you. This is not a diverse family picture. Everyone in this picture looks the same. This is a diverse family picture. I have a good story. I once dated this uh, young woman from uh, an Asian country who had just immigrated with her family, and her parents were not so found, fond of me, and they initially said I could not speak their language. So what I did was I began to learn Mandarin fast, faster than they were learning English. And I, not know, having the right intelligence of the situation, I was quick to brag to them that I was learning Mandarin faster than they were learning English. <laughs> Rather than being impressed, they actually said that they had lost face. So frustrated with my determination, they finally said, your skin color will ruin our family picture. The family picture in your mind marks the boundaries between them and us. And what these parents were trying to say was I could never be one of them. The family picture is an indicator of where your comfort level is. So when I talk about diversity, I say, if you're not ready to bring diversity into your own family picture, sorry, that was the diverse family picture. So if you're not ready to bring diversity into your own family picture, you may not be ready to make diversity work for you. And you know what, that's okay, because not everyone is ready for that. Sometimes it takes even generations. This is my, uh, my cousin uh, Christian and his uh, Japanese wife, Naomi. Now, to be honest with you, uh, they met in Japan, and I thought, because of the occupation of the Japanese in the Philippines, this would never be possible. And if my grandfather had been alive, that probably would have been the case. Now, multiculturalism has a lot of bugs. It's complicated. Not everyone is ready for the update, and there's still a lot of uh, well-hidden xenophobia in Canada. One of my most favorite diversity stories is about Indian women moving into a, a, an elderly care facility that was predominantly white. And despite the fact that there was a lot of tension, they actually found that there was one thing they all had in common. All the women believed that their son had married the wrong woman. <laughs> now, this picture has nothing to do with that. But simple anecdotes like this remind us that we're all connected. Thank you.